for a little bit to be champion. <sighs> you sure we're going about this the right way, Joe? Oh, I'm positive. Please, let me do the thinking. All right, 25. How about it now? Come on! Oh, that's it. That's it. Ah, ah. Good. Very good. All right, let it down easy. Easy. Oh, oh I told you to be careful. You know I got a bad back. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Joe. Sorry. I'll be all right in a minute. I'm bushed. Well, that was three more than yesterday. You're in shape. Joe, so you, you don't reckon we're going off on the deep end of this whole idea? You're not getting scared, are you? No, I ain't scared, but that burn you got me picking up everything and pushing and pulling everything on the wrench. I'm going to be so pooped I can't get into Virginia shit. Oh, that's, that's called conditioning. Conditioning. Yeah. Now, we've gone along with it this far, haven't we? With this training program? All right, just trust me a little bit longer. Yeah. I'll let you do the managing, Joe, but it, it seems to me like I'm doing all the work. Boss. Boss, I'm giving you half of my winnings, aren't I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's all right. All right, you ready for the thumping exercises? Let's have at it. Okay. You ready, Hoss? All right. Ah, let's do something different today. Your head's in shape. We'll work on the body. All right. All set? All right. Oh, you're getting there. You're getting there. You all set, brother? Oh. Hoss, you're there. You are there. What's going on here? Well, hi, Paul. I'm, I'm in training. You're in training? In training for what? Why, uh... Well, tell him, manager. Yeah. Well, you know that circus is coming in town in a few days, Pa? Yeah. Well, they have a wrestler in the circus. See? His name is uh, Bearcat Samson. Mm -hmm. Well, they will give $100 to any man who can pin this Bearcat Samson in five minutes. <laughs> and you're the one who's going to do it. We sure are. Hoss, <laughs> now, heaven knows you're as sturdy as a Missouri mule, but well, this Bearcat Sampson or whatever his name is, he's a professional wrestler. He makes his living at it. Pa! Pa, Hoss is in shape. Look at him. This Bearcat or anybody else won't stand a chance with him. You can't knock him off his feet. Hoss, this man knows every trick in the book. Now, do you, you really think you're ready for him? Well, I don't know, Paul, but I sure hate to think about all this training we've been going through just going to waste. Well, if you want to get your lumps, don't let me stop you. Thanks, Pa. Don't worry. We'll be careful. Oh. I'll, uh, I'll straighten all them out, Paul. Start straightening. Right now. Yes, sir. They'll, they'll be good as new by breakfast. I want you to, to do me a favor. Oh, sure, sure Paul. Now, when Mr. Ramsey from the railway company comes over this afternoon to discuss putting that, that spur across a piece of our property. Yeah. yeah. Sure, what do you want? Will you two stay out of sight? I don't want him to think that whatever your problem is, is hereditary. Take on all challenges. That's it, kid. Cut right in there. Now, start.
us right away. Hurry, hurry, hurry. See Bearcat, Samson, take on all challenges. Come on. Ho, oh, oh, ho, okay, ho. Get in here, folks. Come on. Put that. Wait a minute. All right. Go ahead. As you folks know, the Tweety Circus is prepared to pay $100 to any man who can throw and pin Bearcat Samson in a five-minute fall. Ah, uh, Bearcat! <laughs> Hey, Joey, he does look professional to me. Who, oh, him? He's all brains and no brawn. You'll murder him. He's never run into anything like you before. You reckon? Uh, we'll pin him. We'll flatten him. We'll literally rip him limb from limb. We? Where, where are you getting that we stuff? Wait a minute. You think for one minute you'll be sitting here right now if it wasn't for me? No, I reckon you're right, Joe. Thanks. What are brothers for? And for a try at the one hundred dollars today, we got the uh, Hush Cartwright. Oh, God, love him, but I think that Missouri mule-like brother of mine is about to be had. Oh, looks in pretty good condition to me. Well, you're not forgetting that he's being managed by Little Joe. Yeah, I know, but it's the same. I'll bet you your next month's wages on horse. Well, now, I don't like betting against my own kin, but money is money. You're on. And now, folks, the big contest will begin. Hey! Hard right. All right, this is it. Line him with footwork, boss. Now, you both know the rules. Understand? You pin old Bearcat in five minutes and a hundred dollars is yours. Let's go. Uh, go! go Free wages out of you. He hasn't won yet. All right, pin him! Oh, stop squeezing him and pin him! Hadn't closed with the handle, he'd have pinned Bearcat easily. Well, there's no doubt about it. He's a big, strong boy, but gotta play by the rules, Pop. The rules. Well, you keep up the smart talk, boy. I'll give you some rules to follow. Oh, my ribs. I think they busted. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Bearcat. I guess I just got carried away or something. Oh, you got carried away, all right. Didn't you hear Mr. Tweedy say you had to pin him? Pin him to the ground. You mean we ain't gonna get that hundred? You heard the rules. Oh, my managing wasted. 
I sure feel bad about this, Mr. Tweedy. You feel bad? How do you think he feels? We better get into a doctor. Come on, let's give him a hand. Sure, but then bust none of old Bearcat's ribs. I mean, you sure knocked us out of a hundred dollars by squeezing them so long. You did it, Hoscott, right? Crack four Bearcat's ribs. Yeah, well, we, we, we sure didn't do it intentionally, Mr. Tweedy. Well, that ain't the point. First, I lost all my wild animals at Carson City. And now, Bearcat's will have to be laid up two, maybe three weeks. And outside of old Sheba, I haven't got any other attraction for the Tweedy Circus. Who's old Sheba? A lop-eared elephant who pulls the circus wagon. I sure am sorry, Mr. Tweedy. Feeling sorry ain't gonna keep the Tweedy Circus from going under. Or a feed bear cat's wife and five kids. Five kids? With a wife. Wife. Sure is there something I can do. I... Well, now, son, there just might be now. How could you even think of doing a thing like that? Well, Paul, all we did was promise Mr. Tweedy that I'd take Bearcat's place just for three weeks, just till he got back on his feet again. Yeah, Mr. Tweedy's in real, real bad straits. Oh, he's in real, real bad straits. What about me? I need you here. We gotta supply the ties for that railroad contract I signed with Ramsey. Yeah, well, see, if we'd have, we'd have known about that, Paul, then we, we never would have. Signed that contract with Mr. Tweedy. You signed a contract with Tweedy? Well, yes, sir. Bear, Bearcat's five little kids were involved, Pa. Oh. And a wife. Well, I think you better let him go. Give him a chance to see the cold, cruel world. You stay out of this, Adam. So your contract with Tweedy is more important than my contract with Ramsey. Is he paying you as much as I am? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. You see, Paul, me and little Joe are gonna split $25 for every wrestling match. $25 after every wrestling match. Win or lose? Huh? Oh, I don't, little Joe, what? Well, you, you, you gotta win them. And you make sure that Tweety pays you for the ones that you might win. Now, look, we've been with you for three and a half weeks now, Angus. Bearcat's fine. He can go back into the ring. We've made our final tally. You owe us $400. Boys, as I look back, uh, I think I was a little hasty in making our deal. Meaning what? Well, expenses are high nowadays, mighty high. And, uh, well, uh, the truth is, I'm flat broke. Oh, well, that couldn't be because of those high-stake poker games you get into in every single town we hit, could it? Now, see here, Cartwright. Now, I you don't... see here, Mr. Tweedy. Little Joe's right, and you know it. Every penny we've made for you just goes in one hand right out the other in them dang poker games you play. Yeah. Well, I want a few hands, too. Well, fine. That's fine. And all you got to do is pay us the 400 honest American dollars you owe us right now. Our money, Mr. Tweedy. But you boys don't understand. There's children involved and a little mother. Now, listen, Tweedy. Horse and I were honest with you. We were real, real honest with you. And all we want is the $400 you owe us right now. Now, now, violence will get you nothing. I'll pay you some way. Hey, Paul! Paul, how are you? Well, the lost souls return. Hey! <laughs> well, good well, it's you. good to see you. Adam, how you doing? <laughs> yes, sir, we're back, and me and little Joe ain't above saying it's nice to be aboard again. Well, Paul, we are educated. Well, it's sure good to have you back. Amen. One more week with this slave-driving father of ours, and I'd have been ready to take up wrestling myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> Your older brother's learned a little appreciation while you boys have been gone. Yeah, break up the team, it gets a little tougher, doesn't it? Huh? Right. Well, Hoss, you won them all, didn't you? Oh, boy. I'm just lucky. Oh, lucky heck, boy. It was fantastic, really. Nobody could dent them one right after the other. Pinned them all. Ah, Joe, don't get carried away. I was. Well, Hoss, obviously it must have been good. Look at all the money you made. <laughs> Well, little Joe wrote about four hundred dollars. Yeah, but you—you you, you told us once, pal, a, a little bit of a hundred percent is better than nothing at all. A sad story is about to begin. Now we didn't come back empty-handed. If—if uh, if that's what you're getting at, you don't have to worry about that. Well, is there something we should worry about? Well, no, no. Just that we decided not to. Take the cold cash. We thought it'd be better if we took it out in livestock instead. Oh, well. Sometimes that's very good business. You boys have a, have a good eye for good-blooded stock. Well, where is it? I'd like to see it. Well, it's, uh... It's out in the barn. Well, let's have a look. Well, come on, let's go. After looking at nothing but railroad ties, anything else is bound to look good. Even something that Tweety stuck you with. If I wrestled like you manage, I'd be in the hospital. Well, how many times have I told you, don't worry? Many, 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 many. many. We, we just want to say, we, we know we should have taken the money. Oh, now, look, little Joe, you know what I've always said? A good head of stock is worth its weight in gold in this part of the country. Oh, we, we, we got a real bonanza in there, Pa. Hey, look, Pa, there's, there's something you got to understand. See, me and little Joe... Now, look, Hoss, like I said before, I trust your judgment. Now, let me see this animal that you took instead of cash. Yes, sir. <laughs> She was as, as tame as a plow horse right after a hard day's work in the field. This is what Tweedy gave you for hard cash? Well, he was broke, Pa. What, what, what do you think you're going to do with an elephant? Oh, hey, Pa, maybe we could, maybe we could train her to plow. <laughs> I got to admit, there's a lot of livestock there. I, I just don't believe it. I, I really don't believe it. I, I don't believe that two reasonably intelligent young men could leave home for a couple of weeks and... Come back with an elephant. But, Paul, she's tame. Why, she can, why, she can, she can, she hey, can, she is tame. Let me show you what she can do, Pa. Really, she is tame. Come on. Come here, Sheba. Sheba, come, come, on, come on. Come on, Sheba. Come on. Come on, come on Sheba. Sheba. Come on. Come on. What do you see, Pa? Sheba. Oh, Sheba. Down, Sheba. Down, Sheba. All the way down, Sheba. All the way. That's it. That's it. Up, Sheba. Get rid of her. 
What's the matter, Paul? Don't you like her? Joseph, that peanut burner will, will spook the livestock. Come winter, she'll lead us out of house and home. And there's a touch of fall in the air. Oh, boy. Tweety really slickered you fellas pretty good. Now, you take that elephant back and get the hard cash. Paul, we, uh, we can't do that. Oh, you can, huh? And why not? Because we signed a paper. The same we take the elephant instead of the cash. Now, look. I want that elephant out of here by the time I get back from town. Is that understood? I gotta go in and wire Ramsey, find out when he wants the ties delivered so we can start floating them down Snake Creek. Well, I got the ties cut, but getting them down off the mountain, I'm afraid, is gonna be a job for the uh, lost souls here. Yeah. Adam's done more than his share. Hey, uh, Pa, you know, I, I was just thinking, since you're gonna go into town anyway, I thought maybe you might just talk to Angus Tweedy about taking old Sheba back. And we, we, we could go in with you and, and watch you negotiate the way only you can negotiate, Pa. I could, we could learn something. Yeah, I guess you would learn something. You'll learn how to negotiate those ties down Snake Creek. Adam, you show him the way. I'll show him the way, but I've touched my last railroad tie. Are you, are you going to talk to Mr. Tweedy for us? <clears throat> Please? Boss, now tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. That elephant, is she real gentle like you say? She sure is, boy. She's, she's as gentle as an old hound dog. He's the greatest. You know that stage is more than a half hour late. Look in. Starting your own circus, Ben? Raising the body to be the sock at Ponderosa. No, I'd never believe that in the wide world if I didn't see it myself. Tweety still in town? Yeah, he's pitching his tent right down the street there. Oh, good. Mr. Tweety is going to convert this animal here into hard cash. Good. Come on, Sheba. Come on, Sheba. I remember one time you unloaded Sheba three times. Only to have it back when the new owner couldn't afford a feed bill. Yes, sir, Tweety, you sure got him coming and going. Now, you see here, Bearcat. Ah, uh, don't look now, but here comes part of your family. Sheba, come here. You hold it. Hold it. Sheba, my old Sheba. You don't know how much I've missed you, old girl. That's I'm, uh, I'm Ben Cartwright. How do you do, Mr. Cartwright? Have the boys been taking good care of old Sheba? Well, if you mean by that, has she been eating good? You might say that they've been taking extra good care of her. I've missed the old gal something fierce. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Because, you know, I think she's missed you, too. So why don't you give me the money that you owe my sons, and you can get Sheba back, and you can both be happy with each other. Oh, I'd love to, Mr. Cartwright, but I'm flat broke. I'm sure the boys told you I had a couple of losing poker hands, and... But Mr. Tweedy, how much cold cash could you raise right now to take Sheba off my hands? Well, uh, fond as I am of old Sheba, she ain't getting any younger. Tweety. And with feet so oh, high, much. why... Uh, Mr. Cartwright, way I figure it, old Sheba would be much happier living a life of ease out on your ranch. Here at the circus, she really works for her food. 
No, sir, Mr. Cartwright. I couldn't deny old Sheba this chance to live out her days without a care. You really have a heart of gold, don't you, Mr. Tweedy? Well, who do you think you're trying to flim-flam this time? My sons again? Now, if you think an elephant never forgets... Come on, Sheba. Come on. Sheba would bring customers to your store from miles around, from all over the countryside, just to see her. Not interested, Ben. Now, Mr. Anderson, I just think of this. You get a painted canvas, and you put it over Sheba. And on the canvas, along the side, are the words, Anderson Mercantile. And you parade her all over the countryside, advertising your store. Hmm. No. No, not interested. Mr. Anderson. I'll sell her cheap. How much? Four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars? I've been thinking in terms of fifty or sixty dollars. Now you say four hundred. <laughs> hey, stop her, Ben. Cheaper! Come on, get Get, get out! Get out of there, Cheaper! Sorry, Mr. Anderson. You should be. <laughs> you just bought a sack of peanuts. Ben, I got a complaint about you and that elephant. Complaint? What for? Oh, for just about scaring to death that horse and rider was on the street here yesterday. Well, I got just as much right in the street as that cowboy. Now, Ben, I ain't going to argue that legal point with you, but you're just going to have to get rid of that elephant. I know. I know, Roy. You want to pay cash for those peanuts, or should I put it on your bill? Put it on my bill. <laughs> All right, come on, Sheba. Now, let's go. Sheba, come on. One word from him and she does as she pleases. <laughs> All right. All right. But just as soon as that darn elephant has finished eating those peanuts, you, Roy Coffey, are coming with me officially to call on Mr. Angus Tweedy. Yes, sir. My deal with the Cartwright boys was all fair and square, Sheriff. They signed that paper. And I say that you knew this would happen all along. Sir, you make me out as a conniving scoundrel. Oh, you bet. In spades. Sheriff, has this man any legal claim against me? Nope, none at all. Ben, I'm afraid he's got the win in hand. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you do have the win in hand, Mr. Tweedy. Take it. She's yours. Take it. I told you yesterday I didn't want it. She's getting old, remember? All right, Tweety. How much do you want to, to take Sheba back? Well, uh, I reckon uh, about $200 might change my mind. $200? Did you hear him say $200, Roy? Just turning her into hard cash. What? That's plain blackmail. That's what it is. Just ordinary plain blackmail. Then it all depends on which end you're on. Oh, if I didn't know better, I'd swear that you were in cahoots with him. I'm just trying to be impartial, Ben. Impartial? Roy, 
I campaigned for you in your last election. That was the last election. Oh, wait a minute, Ben. I'm just trying to do my job. I ain't going to pay nobody no $200 to take this bag of pachyderm off my hands. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know this. I want that pachyderm either chained up or out of Virginia City by sundown. Do you understand? Sure been a pretty day, hasn't it? Yeah. Hey, I wonder how Pa's making out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you he's turned old Tweety away with Lex. Yeah. Sure wish I had some of Pa's good business sense. Yeah, Pa and I have an awful lot in common in that area. You know what I was thinking, too? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if maybe Pa gets a little more than the $400, a little extra profit. Look, Joe. If he just gets us our 400 back and breaks us even, I'll be satisfied. Yeah, yeah, amen. Of course, you never can tell. Yeah, never can tell. You just can't stand to see me and little Joe make a few extra dollars, can you, Adam? Apparently, Pa can't either. Down, Sheba. All the way down, Sheba. Rise, Sheba, rise. Hey, hey, Paul, what's the deal? Mr. Tweedy gonna come out here to pick up old Sheba? Nope. Hey, well, you did, you did talk to Mr. Tweedy like you promised, didn't you? Yep. Oh, you, you made plans to, to have Mr. Tweedy pick Sheba up later? Nope. She finally got to you, didn't she, Paul? You kind of like her now, don't you? Decided to keep her, huh? Uh, well, I, uh, I decided that since, uh, since she was really your problem, I wouldn't want to weaken your character by not allowing you to shoulder your own responsibility. That's one way out. What did you say? I say you're right. They'll have to go all out. But, but, Paul, you promised us you'd do the negotiating. Yeah, we were counting on you, Paul. As a matter of fact, we thought you'd even get us more than the $400. Now, look, look, look. I've got more important things to do than negotiate with a larcenous old man and a gluttonous elephant. And incidentally, nobody votes for Roy Coffey next election. Now, about the ties. Ramsey wants them delivered to the spur in a week. Yeah, Paul, about them ties... Adam, did you show the boys where you cut them? I sure did. They're uh, all roughed out and stacked. Good. Then you can start floating them down in the morning. We can. Now, Joseph, I've had two very tough days, and I'm in no uh, mood... Pa, little Joe's telling the plain truth for a change. And what's that? Oh, uh, Paul, the, the creek run dry. Creek's gone dry? Yep. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Gods have turned against me. All right, look. First thing in the morning, first thing in the morning, we'll, we'll put on our thinking caps and we'll try to figure out some way of getting those blasted logs down off that mountain. I'll get right at it, Pa. Yeah, it's a good idea, Pa. I'll set the alarm clock extra early in the morning, jump right up and get right to thinking. That reminds me of a thing. I want an around-the-clock sentry duty on that elephant while she's here at the ranch. Starting in the morning? Around the clock, horse. What for? She's tame. Uh, she's tame, all right. She's also sneaky. Look, pa, if you want me to figure out how to get those logs off the mountain, I've got to get some sleep. Joseph, just keep your eye on her. Get it, Sheba. 
That ain't funny. You ain't nothing but a nuisance. Just like Paul said, you're sneaky, too. It's time for little Joe to relieve me. I'm gonna go get him. You stay right here. And don't you move. You stay right here and I'll be back. You hear? You stay. You stay here. You stay there now, Sheba. Look out. You stay there. Breaking all the windows in the house, you know, Pa's gonna really get angry at you. I thought you was up there asleep. Sleeping? Are you kidding? I'm up there thinking. I'm worn out. But I think I finally came up with an idea. Yeah? What is it? Now here's, here's what we're gonna do. Whoop. Whoop. Like I told you, Pa, $200 and I take old Sheba off your hands. $200? No wonder Pa was in such a state when he come home yesterday, Joe. Well, make up your mind, boys. Bear Cat and me are moving today. Then how are you gonna get along with that old Sheba? <coughs> Easy, son. Made me enough at poker last night to buy us a real fine mule. Don't need old Sheba, no how. Only use her to haul the wagon and attract attention. I can make just as much off Bear Cat without her. Is that right? That's right, son. So put up or shut up. You know, horses, just like Pa said, live and learn. Yep. yep. Take the bad with the good. Yep. Or if you can't lick them, join them, right? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Just, just like my brother Hoss said. You see, Mr. Tweedy, we've been thinking very seriously about going in the circus business ourselves. What? Well, why not? We got everything you've got and more. Got old Sheba here to pull the wagon. Got brother Hoss here to wrestle all comers. You can't do that. Oh, can and will, Mr. Tweedy. Town for town. Same towns you're in. You see, Mr. Tweedy, we got a little angle all figured out of our own. We'll come over and I'll wrestle a bear cat, and after I whoop him, <laughs> then we'll invite all of your customers over to our tent, and I'll take on all the challengers. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Oh, live and learn, Mr. Tweedy. Put up or shut up. Yeah, gotta take the bad with the good. All right. Even Steven. I take old Sheba back, period. Uh, just a minute. There's also a matter of $400 you owe us. With interest. And not a cent less. I ain't got a penny. Paid all my poker winnings for the mule. We'll take, we'll the, take mule. the mule. Sold! She's up at Barney's stable. Come on, Hoss. Sheba, sure wish we could afford it, you. Hoss, one appetite like yours is enough for any family. First time I've seen you, Took. Took? <laughs> I got old Sheba back, ain't I? I got Haas to work for us for nothing, didn't I? All it cost me was a spavin mule I won in a poker game. That man ain't been born that can take Angus Tweedy. It takes real managerial brains to get along nowadays, you know? Yeah, I reckon. Yeah. Hey, you know, wait till Pines about the deal we just pulled off. <laughs> yeah, I reckon we did throw that pin old Angus the map, didn't we? Oh, we did that? <laughs> hey, you know something I was wondering? I'm just wondering what a real fine mule will fetch right now. I don't know, Joe, but he's got to be pretty valuable. You know, Angus ain't one to be took. <laughs> Hey, Pop! 
Oh, horse, I'm worn out. Yeah, that was a long ride for you, Joe. Hello, Adam. Uh-huh. Well. Where have you fellas been? Well, I'll wait till you're here. One, one thing at a time. I have come up with a solution to our problem. Yeah, but I just want to tell you about old Sheba. Exactly, old Sheba. Now, we need a physical force to bring those ties down off the mountain, right? Now, the creek's dried up, so that physical force is gone, right? Now, there's no road up there, lots of rocks. So we daren't use horses for fear of breaking legs, right? Now, what other physical force do we have in the Ponderosa right here and now? Horse? Oh, no, no, no. Come on, think that. Try to figure out how do you use one problem to solve another problem? Well, what other problem do we have? Old Sheba? Exactly, old Sheba! You know, I remember seeing pictures once of uh, elephants in India. They're hauling whole trees. That's exactly right, Adam. So you put a harness on Sheba, put a sled behind her, and she'll haul those ties down from that mountain as pretty as you please. Pa? Now, come on, get Sheba out of the barn. Let's get going. Yeah, well, Pa, uh... Well, what, what? Well, I... Speak right up, little manager. Speak right up. We see, Horse and I took old Sheba into town, and, uh... And slickered Mr. Tweedy into taking her back. Pretty, pretty as you please. Yeah, we, <laughs> we slickered him. <laughs> what? Oh, we, we didn't come back empty-handed. Oh, it, there's a, look at that. That, that magnificent elephant. That royal pachyderm for that, that mule. Was the only thing of real value he had, Pa. It's the only thing. Quiet! For weeks, I labored to negotiate a deal with the railway company to put a spur track on our property. For weeks, I worked to negotiate a contract to sell timber for those railway ties. And for those same weeks, you two were gallivanting around the country, wrestling your time away. You were through playing around. Those ties are up in the mountain. They have to be at the spur line in one week. One week. Yeah, one week. That's what he said. Tuck it out myself. Well, we did it, Pa. We did it. Every single one of those ties is off the mountain and at the spur. I knew I could do it if I put my mind to it. Your mind. Well, I must say, I never thought you could do it. Oh, you did a real good job. Well, Pa, it's an unbeatable combination. Brains and brute strength. Well, <clears throat> little Joe, in all fairness to your brain power, if it hadn't been for uh, horses' muscle power, those ties would still be up on top of that mountain. 
Yes, but without my conditioning, he wouldn't have had the muscles to pull the ties off the mountain. <laughs> oh, it must be raining a deluge up on that mountain. Oh, Snake Creek will be running in a matter of minutes. We well, can't win them all, Hawks. <laughs> Did you hear that? Snake Creek's got water in it. It's gonna be flooding. It's gonna be full, Joe. There's water in Snake Creek. Water. Yeah, there's water in Snake Creek. That's what we've been waiting for, Hoss. Yeah? Water in Snake Creek. You know what that means? That now you can enter the annual Snake Creek Canoe Contest. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Wow. And all you need is a good manager and a big, big canoe. Yeah. A thousand dollars. Wow. Now, here's what I'm going to do for you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your kind attention. Now, to continue with the demonstration, you must remember one thing. Pocket billiards, sometimes commonly referred to as pool, is a gentleman's game. Uh, it should uh, be a very good game for you, uh, <coughs> gentlemen. <coughs> now, for my next shot, I would like to demonstrate one that requires all the science and skill of this wonderful game. It's called the bank shot. That fellow there sold me the table. He's gonna be staying in town a couple of weeks to demonstrate and give some lessons. Hey, Hoss, why don't you give it a try? Oh, no, Sam, come on. It looks a little fancy for me. Oh, come on, Hoss, try it. You heard him, Sam. Besides, didn't you hear the man say it's a gentleman's game? Big game back east. That's where they invented it. Your pardon, sir. For your information, the game of pocket billiards is not a... Only a most honorable one, but a very ancient one to boot. Certainly, it was known in Shakespeare's day. Is that a fact? Oh, yeah. Wasn't it uh, Antony and Cleopatra, Act Two, now yeah, Scene Five, where Shakespeare has Cleopatra say, "Let us to billiards. Come, come in." <laughs> Shakespeare, and you, sir. My name's Carteret, Hoss Carteret. I know. Mr. William Shakespeare and Mr. Hoss Carteret. My name is Parker, Whitney Parker. At times my friends call me Whit. And upon other occasions, my legal opponents call me <laughs> Half Whit. <laughs> you, uh, your lawyer. Mm, that's what it says in my diploma. Yet. You uh, figuring on hanging around Virginia City? Maybe. Maybe I, I kind of like the looks of things around here. Now that gentleman is called the break shot. That starts off the game. <coughs> now, which one of you gentlemen would like to try to take this cue and put some of those balls in the pocket? Well, now, really, gentlemen. I'm offering you a great opportunity here to learn this game. It's an awful lot of fun. It won't cost you one cent. I'm sure, gentlemen, that you... What, don't I have any takers? <laughs> I'm giving two to one he doesn't even hit that little ball with a stick. How about it, Cartwright? You, uh... 
You got your big brother's permission to bet? Never mind, my brother. How much do you want to bet? Oh, make it, make it 25 against your 50. You got to bet. <laughs> sure. I think I'd better show you how to hold the cue. Uh, <clears throat> this is the cue. <clears throat> Sir, are a magnificent instructor. You have my highest recommendation. Fifty dollars, Mr. Derby. You and his tin horner in cahoots. You're nothing but a dirty swindler, Cartwright. The bet's off. My compliments, sir. A beautiful break shot with nature's own cue stick. <laughs> if you should ever need any legal advice, Mr. Cartwright, feel free to call on me for you, my good man. Keep the change. Gentlemen, good day. Let's hope you never need a lawyer that bad, Hoss. couple weeks off the ranch. Hey, uh, Benji, you want to you wanna do me a big favor? Take a take a look at that right foreleg on that horse of mine. He's been limping something fierce. And you got such a good way with animals. Sure. Just as soon as I... Oh, here, here, here. Oh, there ain't no use me fooling around something like this when there's something important to do like taking care of my horse. Son of a gun's kind of moody, Benji. I reckon he's just in a mood to limp. I'll walk it out of him. Look at him. What I tell you about it being moody, see, now, he, now he's in the mood to walk. Mr. Cartwright, you think I'll ever be big and strong like you? I don't know, Benji. That sort of depends on how big your folks was. Oh, my gosh, you ain't big. My grandpa, he was a real big and they said. Monstrous. <laughs> well, in that case, Benji, if you concentrate on it real hard, I'll bet you one of these days you'll make it. I'll sure try, Mr. Cartwright. I'll bust my britches trying. Well, I gotta go now. Bye-bye. So long, Benji. Watch this one, boys. Now I shall demonstrate a shot executed in the most difficult manner possible. Watch carefully. That's 
Gentlemen, thank you for the game. Yeah, why don't you fellas divvy these up between you, huh? How do, Mr. Cartwright? Howdy, Mr. Parker. How are you, sir? Pretty, uh, pretty fancy shooting there. Huh? Oh, well, uh, with, uh, I see you hung out your shingle already. Yes, yes, I thought I'd stay around for a while. Oh, by the way, that offer of mine still holds good. I think I can always manage to squeeze in another client. Yeah, well, good. I, uh, I'm in need of a little advice, as a matter of fact. I, I just been called as a witness on a lawsuit. That's so. Come on in. Tell me about it. No, oh, since I last saw you, I've been pretty busy handing out free legal advice in between shooting some pocket billiards and uh, playing marbles with some future clients. You don't even keep the marbles. That ain't no way to get rich. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All my advice isn't free. Besides, I got a big case coming up. DeWitt Parker, the companion of the Illinois Eighth Circuit from his friend A. Lincoln. Yes, I was proud to be his partner. Uh, another lawyer, huh? Not just another lawyer. That's Abe Lincoln. The Abraham Lincoln, leader of the Illinois Bar. <laughs> oh, not the kind of bar that I've been frequenting lately. You know, back east, there's some talk of him running for president. Oh, he's a great man. First-rate marble player, too. <laughs> I ain't never heard of a president of the United States being a marble player. <laughs> well, he may be the first if he's nominated. Yeah, he just loves to play models with those two boys of his, Willie and Ted, you know, and their friends. Bowls a good game of ten pins, too, with those long arms of his, you know? Well, uh, what else are you good at besides uh, marbles and ten pins? Well, one thing, he'd tell you a joke, make you split your slides laughing. Well, take it from me. A man like that ain't gonna never be president of the United States. He ain't serious-minded enough. The president's gotta be serious and smart. Oh, he's smart, all right. He spots just that, uh, oh, he uses a joke maybe to illustrate a point, you know, like uh, like when he and Mr. Stephen Douglas having those debates back in Quincy, you know, when they're both running for the United States Senator. I remember one time he said, Mr. Douglas, he says, that argument of yours is about as measly soup you'd get from boiling the shadow of a pigeon that's been starved to death. <laughs> that is a good one. Oh, sir. Brought you in here to talk about your case, and here instead I'm talking about Mr. Lincoln. I'm afraid that's an old habit of mine. Sort of nasty business. It involves the Durfee brothers. The Durfees? Yeah. You remember that feller that tried to Welsh on that bet with me in the saloon that day when me and you first met? Yeah, yeah, I know the Durfees. What about him? Well, that one's Ev. Now, he ain't nothing but a bully. But his brother, his brother Flint, he's a smart one. Sometimes a little bit too smart. For years, he's been trying to wrangle the water rights off of old Nat Sheldon. And those water rights are about the only thing that was worth leaving that Nat left his family. And now, Flint Durf is trying to steal him from him. Steal him? Hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty strong statement, Hoss. Well, not in this case, it ain't. See, I know Flint Durfee. Flint Durfee's hired me to be his lawyer. You got yourself a pretty rotten case then, Mr. Parker. I'm not the kind of lawyer who's going to get mixed up in anything shady. You have now. Well, now, you, uh, you seem to know more about this case than I do. Yeah, I probably do. Look, Mr. Parker, about three weeks ago, I rode out to Nat Sheldon's place. Nat's been sick for several days. I found him laying there on the sofa in his parlor with a pen still in his hand. And Flint Durfee pocketing a piece of paper while his brother Ev looked on. That piece of paper... Signed over the water rights to the Sheldon place to Flint Durfee for nearly nothing. He'd been sick. He was clear out of his head. Now old Nat's dead. And Flint Durfee's watering his herd on the Sheldon place. Tomorrow, I'm going to be in court backing up young Nat Sheldon's case against that fraud. I've never asked you to use what little brains you've got, only your muscles. You can't even use those. But, Flint... All you had to do was throw those squatters off our land. That's all. Just throw them off. But, Flint, they had guns. You want me to get shot or something? Come in. Uh, 
Have a drink? No. No, well, thank you. I'd uh, just like to have a little talk with you. Well, talk away. Had a visit from Horse Cartwright a while back. He tells me that old Nat Sheldon was out of his head when he signed that agreement. You're not going to believe Horse Cartwright over me, are you? Was he out of his head when he signed it? Well, what's the difference? I got the paper with his name on it, see? And my brother Ev here and me were witnesses. You haven't got a thing to worry about. Now, would you like to have that little drink? I'm not the kind of lawyer you evidently think I am. You'll be well paid, like I promised. That's all that matters. You go buy yourself another lawyer. You walk out on me, I'll see you never get another case in this here town! You want me to stop and flinch? Shut up, you fool! I'll tell everybody I threw you off the case because you were too drunk to handle it. Do you hear me? Drunk! 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 Us? No. No, thank you. I've temporarily lost my taste for whiskey. Beer, if you please. Unfortunately, Hoss, you were right about Mr. Durfee. Pity. Would have been a nice fat fee, too. Here, here. I got this. Thanks, Hoss. Flint, hmm? Hard name, hard man. Reminds me of a fellow in one of Mr. Lincoln's stories. A rattlesnake bit him on the chin. Well, the fellow recovered. But the snake died. Whip. What's wrong with a with a fellow like Flint, anyhow? I remember Mr. Lincoln walking down a street in Springfield one time. He had his two boys, Tad and Willie, you know, one tucked under each arm. Crying fit to bust. So I asked Mr. Lincoln what the matter was. Whit, he says to me. The same thing that's wrong with the world. He says, I got three walnuts in my pocket. Each of them wants two of them. She agreed. That's what's wrong with Mr. Durfee. And that brother of his. He's sheer honor. He'd be mighty careful with. His bite's worse than a rattlesnake's. Now, Cost, come on, you're making me nervous. <laughs> Take it, he lost the case. Look, Whip, why'd you let them two buffalo you like that just now? Buffalo me? <laughs> My friend, it is better to yield your path to a mad dog than to be bitten by him in contesting the right of way. Besides, killing the dog wouldn't cure the bite, now would it? That sounds like some more of that talk from your friend, Mr. Lincoln. The fact of the matter, it is. Well, you don't back down from a man. Hoss, you don't think I took that childish performance of Durfee seriously now, do you? Look, Whit, Flint Durfee ain't no child. You can't be afraid or weak. Not and survive, not out here. See you, I gotta be running. Oh, how about you and me playing a little pocket buddies? Huh? Come on, I'll teach you the game. 
I got a bunch of business I got to take care of with. Tonight? Well, I'm going to be busy tonight, too. I'm leaving town in the morning. I'll see you. All right. <laughs> Hiya, Benji. Hi, Mr. Cartwright. Mind if I walk with you? No. Enjoy the company. You don't want to stay up too late, though. It might stunt you grow. Well, I just had to stay up late fixing up these packages for Mrs. Gentry. Usually I get to bed pretty early, though. I think I just grew some since last week, don't you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think you grew something right then. <laughs> I gotta deliver these packages now, Mr. Cartwright. Well, I'll see you in the morning, Benjamin. Uh, night, Mr. Cartwright. Let me buy it, Irvy. The streets plenty wide. Get out of my way. I'll take care of him, Flint. No! Shot my brother. Hoss Kyright killed him. He killed him in cold blood. Hey, are, Ben. Thank you, Roy. How's the head? Well, it's feeling a whole lot bigger, but not a whole lot better, I'm afraid. Boss, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to get you out on bail. Ev Durfee made it hard all around. Even got him to get a, an outside prosecuting attorney. Who? Byron Evans of Carson. Oh, boy. A real hanging prosecutor. He's never failed to convict. Yeah, well, let's hope that this time we can spoil his record. Yeah, I sure hope so. And that's why I think we need the best man we can possibly get, no matter who, Hoss. Paul already got a lawyer, Whit Parker. Well, that's what I'm trying to get at, Hoss. Nobody knows him. You hardly know him. He's a stranger whose best friend is a bottle. Well, that's one that Elf Durfee started. Look, Hoss, now you know very well that it's hard enough for a lawyer to try a case when he's sober. And Mr. Parker is a hard drinker. Isn't he? Paul, all I know is that Whit Parker ain't gonna let drinking get in the way of doing the best job he can for me. Paul, he's smart. He's real smart. If I'd have listened to his advice, I wouldn't be here now. Hoss, I'm talking about your life. We can't risk this man. That's right, Paul. It is my life. And that's why I need to have the choice in deciding who's going to defend it. Look, Paul, he's heard my side of it, and he says we got an easy case. Easy case? No murder case is easy. It needs intelligent handling. It needs Paul, a man... Paul, Whit Parker ain't a nobody like you think. Back in Illinois, he was, a, he was a very important lawyer. One of his best friends is Abraham Lincoln. You've heard of him, ain't you? Yes. Yes, I've heard of him. If Mr. Parker was such a big and important man back in Illinois, why did he leave there to come out here? Why? Yeah, would you send that off, please? Mr. 
Mr. Abraham Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois. Do you know lawyer Whitney Parker? If so, please telegraph this city, collect your judgment of Parker as defense attorney in murder trial. He is defending my son. Signed, Ben Cartwright. Meanwhile, let's make sure this Mr. Parker doesn't get drunk and lose the case. Not this case. the special prosecutor. I'd, uh, you know, like to get to meet him over a game of pocket billiards. Never does any harm to get to know your enemy. Your enemy's in sight, all right, but it's in a bottle. Madam, I don't need a nursemaid. Let's just keep walking, huh? This is a crime so heinous, so dastardly, as to freeze the very marrow of your bones. The prosecution will prove that the defendant, Horse Cartwright, did without provocation, with malice aforethought, and with premeditation, shoot and murder an unarmed victim. The unfortunate Flint Durfee. A person so, so ill-treated by faith that, that he had to use a cane to support his, his poor, crippled body. We will show that when Flint Durfee's heroic efforts to fend off his brutal assailant with his staff, his cane, his crutch, as it were, failed. The end was merciless, cold-blooded, black-hearted murder by the miserable assassin sitting there. I ask, I demand that Horse Cartwright pay the penalty for that murder that he be hung by the neck until he is dead, dead, dead. He sure paints a pretty picture, don't he? Any word from Mr. Lincoln? No, not a word. He just came back from the telegraph office, nothing. Probably thinks the whole thing's a hoax. He's never heard of Parker. Just try to convince Hoss of that. After this, if we don't hear pretty soon, I'm gonna get another lawyer whether Hoss likes it or not. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, I should like to compliment the prosecuting attorney on his fine display of eloquence. Indeed, one might say of Mr. Evans, as has been said of the great Daniel Webster, that when he speaks, he just shines his eyes, throws out his arms, and twirls his tongue around a couple of times, opens his mouth, 
and leaves the consequences to heaven. <laughs> and now, if you'd be gracious enough to overlook my... my lack of eloquence, we shall prove that since my client, Horse Cartwright, is innocent, the only other person at the scene of the crime, other than the deceased, is guilty. Ev Durfee. <laughs> Mr. Durfee, will you please tell us, in your own words, what happened the tragic night your brother was shot down? Well, sir, as Flint and I turned the corner and we were walking along, we met Horse Cartwright. Let me by, Cartwright. The street's plenty wide, Derby. Out of my way, Cartwright! What are you gonna do? You gonna hit me with that cane, Flint? It's about time somebody's teaching you a lesson. I'll take care of him, Flint. <laughs> He shot my brother. Horse Kyright killed him. And that's the living truth. He's a living liar. Your witness, Mr. Parker. Ah, uh, Mr. Jeffy. Is it not true that for years your brother used you as a sort of protector? Well, if you mean protecting him from a murderer such as Horse Cartwright, yes. Except that uh, you didn't finally protect him from murder, did you? You loved your brother. Well, yeah, sure. Why did you love him? Huh? What was there about him that made you love him? Well, I can't answer such a dumb question as that. Very well, then tell me, why did you hate him? What? What did you hate more? That he was rich and paid you off in a cowhand's measly salary? Or that he was smart and he was contemptuous of your ignorance? That he commanded and you groveled? What did you hate most? Tell me! I see here, your honor! That is an unfair question, Mr. Parker. The witness need not answer. No more questions. What? Call Horse Cartwright right to the stand. And then? Well, then I did sure enough meet up with Flint Durfee, just like his brother said. But I wasn't going to let Flint Durfee buffalo me like he did Mr. Parker. Let me buy Durfee. The streets plenty wide. Get out of my way. I'll take care of him, Flint. No! When Flint hit me with his cane, my gun went off in the air and I almost blacked out. My head cleared and I saw that Ev had shot his brother. That's the way it really happened. Thank you, Hoss. Your witness? No questions. Very well, Ross. You may step down. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, we, we now have one man's word against another. But there was a third witness to the murder. And that is Benji Lane. It's just like Mr. Cartwright said. When I saw Skin Flint Durfee hit him with his big old cane, and Mr. Hoss was hurt something awful. And his gun went up in the air. Thank you, Benji. <coughs> uh, just a moment, Benji. Yes, sir? You and a horse cart ride are great friends, aren't you, Benji? We sure are. Horse cart ride's a hero to you. Someone you want to grow up to be like. Now, isn't that so, Benji? Yes, sir. Just how much do you really like him? Well, like I told you, a whole lot. Enough to lie for him? If, if it would save his life. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I object, Your Honor. Objections overruled. Answer the question, Benji. Mm, sure, I'd lie to save his life. But, Benji, when you told your story, I understand, here just now, you didn't lie then, did you? No, sir. I told exactly what I saw. Good boy. Good boy. Dr. Kleiser, you performed the autopsy on the deceased, Mr. Flint Durfee. I did, sir. Using yourself as a model doctor, would you show the course taken by the fatal bullet? Yes, sir. The bullet entered an inch above the navel, here. And at large, an inch to the right of the fifth lumbar vertebra, here. About five inches lower. Note that, gentlemen. Then what direction did the bullet take, Doctor? Why, downward, of course. Cartwright and his victim were both in an upright position. The gun was slanting down when fired. I object, Your Honor. That is an opinion of the witness. On the contrary, it is incontrovertible evidence. If, as counselor contends, Mr. F. Durfee shot his brother, the course of the bullet would have had to have been upwards. But it didn't go up. It went down, down, gentlemen, down. Proving that Horse Cartwright is not only a liar, but guilty of unprovoked attack and cold-blooded murder! Order! Order in the court! Order! Boss, your father wants me to withdraw from the case. Now look, Paul... Don't I... you realize the dangerous situation you're in? Do you realize that if something doesn't happen before that court reopens this afternoon, that jury will go out with a foregone verdict? Paul, I'm sure that will. Mr. Parker doesn't seem to have one notion of an idea. That's right, Hoss. Right now, I don't have one idea. Mr. Parker, I seem to recall that you told my son this would be an easy case. Well, what happened? How come you having the same information Evans had? Because I believed what your son told me, Mr. Cartwright. Whit, don't you still believe me? Yes, Horace, but... Well, maybe when Flint struck you, you fired at him without really knowing. No. No, I, I was dizzy, but I wasn't that dizzy. My gun went off in the air. Yeah, well, maybe a new lawyer will be able to come up with something. I don't want a new lawyer. Hoss. Stick with me. I think maybe it's time I told you what happened with Mr. Lincoln and me. He, uh, he was traveling the 8th Judicial District, you know. And he shares his cases in different towns with different lawyers. I was his associate in Clinton, Illinois. Well, we were trying an important case. Mr. Lincoln had to leave town before we finished, so I took over on my own. And then some uh, trouble come up at home. I went out and got roaring drunk. First time ever, you know, but while I was working. That is, I made a spectacle of myself. Lost the case. I was afraid to face my client and Mr. Lincoln, mostly Mr. Lincoln. So I just decided to run off, heading for California. Wound up this far. Look, Whit, do me a favor. Don't run away this time. Hoss, believe me, you. I'd be much better off with some other lawyer. I hope so, son, yes. Well, gee, I don't know why they don't believe Mr. Haas and me. 
You wouldn't lie about a thing like that. I know that. I know that, Banshee, but you see, the, uh, the medical testimony. But it was as plain as day, Mr. Parker. Yeah, I know. I know that's what you testified in court, Benji, and we appreciate it. You tell Mr. Hoss I'll do that testifying again, anytime he wants me. I'll tell him so. Thanks, Benji. Parker, are you sure? I'm sure. What is it, Mr. Cartwright? I'd, I'd like to request a little time to hire a new attorney. Mr. Cartwright! Mr. Cartwright, sir, will you please, would you postpone that request? Well, Mr. Parker, you voluntarily withdrew from... I know, I know, sir, but I have an idea. I realize your son's life is at stake, but... Do you think you, you could give me one more chance? All right. Your Honor, I, I withdraw the request. Very well. Thank you, sir. Your Honor? I have a request that I believe essential to, to the defense. What is it, Mr. Parker? I request that the billiard table in the Silverado Saloon be brought into this courtroom. I object, Your Honor, at this indignity. But this is a trial, not a circus. Your Honor, Horse Cartwright has more than mere dignity to lose. I beg that you grant my request. I now call Mr. Byron Evans to the stand. Your Honor. Mr. Evans, I don't think it necessary that you be sworn in. But as a fellow enthusiast of the ancient and honorable game of pocket billiards, may I ask you please to demonstrate your expert technique for the gentlemen of the jury? Mr. Parker, is this uh, relevant to your defense? I assure you, Your Honor, it is most relevant. Seven, you please. By all means. Thank you. Uh, now, would you uh, straighten up, please, Mr. Evans? Uh, please observe very carefully, gentlemen, that the point here in the front where the cue touches Mr. Evans' chest, now that he has straightened up, is higher and then the back portion of the queue, where it would touch him here. However, before, when he was bent over, the point here in front, which is higher now, was lower than the point in back. Now, just for the moment, now let us imagine that the billiard cue, held in this position, represents the line of fire of the bullet. Now, is this the way you saw them, Benji? 
Yes, sir. Old Skinflint was bent over his brother, just like you are. Can't you do anything right, you bumbling fool? Now, oh. the bullet hit Flint Durfee in the stomach, ranged upward and lodged in the lower back. Now, observe. This represents the line of fire of the bullet. It looks as though it was fired downward. But, as you've just seen, it wasn't. No. It was fired upward. By F. Durfee. That's a lie! Lying on your back as the brother you hated bent over you, trying to strike you with this cane, just as he had struck Horse Cartwright, knocking him temporarily senseless so that he didn't see how you shot your brother. A lie! I think the jury will decide who is lying, Mr. Durfee. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Paul? Paul, what did I tell you? Did I tell you I had a good lawyer? Yeah, you sure did. I was wrong. And I'm sorry. Ah. Parker, again, I... I just don't know how we can thank you, all of us. You'll get your chance, Mr. Cartwright, when I send you my bill. Benji? This telegram just came for you. Oh. Mr. Bartlett asked if I'd give it to you. Thank you, Benji. Parker? I think maybe you better read this. Just returned from out of town, replying to your inquiry, my friend Whitney Parker is a first-rate attorney. I would still trust him to defend my life. Tell him I have some cases needing his rare talents. Hey, Lincoln. Yeah, Mr. Parker. You probably have more cases in this town than you can shake a shingle at. We should be happy to have you around. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you very much, sir. But I'm kind of curious about some of these cases that Mr. Lincoln may have tucked up that long sleeve of his, you know. Besides, I... I've never been able to trim him at anything. Now, he can beat me bowling. Marble shooting? Marble shooting, yes. I'd like to get him into one game where I know I could beat him. Like, uh, like uh, pocket billiards. Mm -hmm. Well, it did save an innocent man's life, didn't it, Hoss? <laughs> Seems to me that would be one argument he couldn't resist. <laughs> Benji! That Mr. Bartlett friend of yours, huh? I'm gonna send me a telegram. do for you? Are uh, you Mr. Cartwright? That's right. Well, my name's Harry Starr. Do you mind if I have some of that water? Oh, help yourself. Thank you. Uh... 
What happened to your horse? I had to sell him for his feed bill. And mine. Mr. Cartwright, I'm looking for a job. I sure hope you have work for me. Well, Mr. Starr, I think you're in luck. We're looking for some extra hands for Roundup, so... Uh, well, why don't you take your gear, put it in the bunkhouse, we can start you out in the morning. I thank you, sir. You know, this is a... handsome Palomino you have here. Oh, you know the breed? Oh, yes. I worked one up in Oregon. Oh. Well, maybe someday I'll let you... I'll let you work this one. When? <laughs> Well, you can start by putting him up in the barn. <laughs> That'll be a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, Pa. Well, how's things at the roundup? Oh, just great, Paul. Adam says he ain't never seen so many little twin calves, all fat and sassy. Oh, yeah? Hey, who's that? My new stallion. No, no, the fellow was... <laughs> I know, new hand I just took out. Good, we need some. Yeah, well, like the five new men in there. I've had them working on a new remoter. They should be ready to join Adam in the morning. I hope you get the idea, Engine. If you don't, Lee Burton will be glad to give you a few more lessons. I'm not gonna fight you, mister. Maybe I'll let you decide that, and maybe I won't. It's decided. Now, both of you, listen. This goes for the rest of you and you men, too. This is a working ranch. We don't have any time for gentlemanly sports. It's get along or get out. There's just one more rule. Anything you break, you fix. Now, both of you shake hands. I don't shake hands with no Indian. I'll draw my pay first. All right, Burton. You've been here two days. Your dollars ought to about cover that. I'll go to the barn and get some tools and fix that rail. Where you get your boots, Harry? Yeah, take your time. We're gonna be a while. Why don't I go down to the blacksmith with you and I can help you unload this stuff? Don't worry. Come on, we can manage. We'll be back to get you in a minute. All right. Take your time. Get up. Get up. Don't you know better to serve Indians in here? I didn't know he was Injun. Well, that's what he is. And you know, Injuns and fire water don't mix. Will you look at the boots this guy's got on? Brand new and shiny. None of us here got new boots. Not even halfway new. Most of us could probably stand on a five-cent piece and tell whether it was heads or tails. Speak for yourself, stranger. I haven't seen a five-cent piece in so long. Didn't know which was head or tails. That's cause engines and breeds took all the jobs. Like this one here, came along and got me fired from a good job. 
Now, who ever heard of an engine wearing a white man's boots anyway? They'll ruin his feet. And that would sure be a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Why, it's our duty to look after our poor, uneducated red brother. Same thing on this one, buddy. Got it? Yeah. Let's pick up Harry. Yeah. You know, for an engine, he sure does talk good English, don't he? Yeah, he not only talks good, you've been watching with those horses the last couple of days? He talks pretty good to them, too, don't he? Darn right. Yep. Yeah, that's one thing about a horse. It don't make any difference what color the man's skin that gets on him. He knows it's a man when he's on there. Hey. Pull by the saloon. Get up. Get up. Who did this to you? It doesn't matter. Look, nobody can get away with this. Not in this town. Now, who did it? Do me a favor, Joe, and get me out of here. Joey needs help. Let's get him the weapon. Come on. Bring him on. Come on. Get up. Get up. Nothing but admiration for a man who bucks big odds and fights his own battles. You know, sometimes it just isn't practical. And that's why we have a government of law and officers to enforce that law. Well, Mr. Cartwright, those laws don't apply to me. Mm -hmm. Have you tried them? Sure, I've tried them. Now, suppose I named the men that beat me up and brought charges against them. But what court ever took the word of a half Comanche for anything? Look, Harry, without your telling us, we know that the man Pa fired was in on this somehow. Now, why not just admit it? Please, Joe, let's forget the whole thing. And after tomorrow, you can forget about Harry Starr, because I'm moving on. You can't keep running all the time. Oh, yes, you can. That's how I've stayed alive up till now. You see, I know that if I stay around here and work the roundup, the same thing will happen again. Trouble. Not while we're around. Well, I thank you, but I guess the only hope for me is to find a job someplace where the only thing I can offend are rattlesnakes and jackrabbits. Boys, would you say that Harry has just given us an excellent description of the line shack up in Perdido Canyon? Yeah, it sure does, Pa, like he'd been there. You know, we've got a lot of work that has to be done up there in Perdido Canyon. It's lonely work, but it's yours if you want it. I sure don't know why you folks bother with me, Mr. Cartwright. Well, I reckon it's about time somebody did, huh, Harry? A little joke and ride out with you is, well, as soon as you feel up to it. If you're willing to take a chance with me. I thank you, sir. I hope you're never sorry. Joe, why don't you take Harry up to his room? I think he needs a little rest. Right, Pa. Come on, Harry. Yeah, you're up early this morning. Yeah, me and Sunrises are old friends. You feeling better? Just as good as new. When you're ready to go out to that line shack. Anytime you say. I'm ready right now, as soon as I put this horse in the stall. <laughs> You mind if I ask a favor? Go ahead. You think your pa would mind if I climbed aboard this horse and just to get the feel of him? Go ahead, pa wouldn't mind. 
care of that? How about another cup of coffee, Joe, before you leave? Don't mind if I do. You make good coffee. Yeah. Good at coffee making and horse breaking. I guess it's because I've had plenty of practice at both. You like horses, don't you, Harry? Yeah, that's the Indian part of me, Joe. It's like they say. An Indian takes better care of its horse than he does his squaw. <laughs> hey, tell me, how long did you, did you live with your people? Well, Joe, the Comanches are no more my people than a white man is. See, my mother was a captive white woman and my father was a big brave until he met up with white man's firewater. And soon after my mother died, they just kicked him right out of the tribe. Well, what happened to you then? Oh, they had as little use for me as they did my mother and father. You see, Joe, when you're only half of something, you're really half of nothing. So I left. Well, you had it pretty rough. Well, it taught me a lot. I picked up a few things, like making coffee, breaking horses, and living alone. Yeah, living alone. It's one thing about living alone, you don't have to put up with the likes of Lee Burton. By golly, that's right. That's one good thing. I don't have to put up with the Lee Burtons. Thanks for the coffee. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with some supplies for you. All right, Joe. Joe, thanks again for the help. All right. See you in a couple of weeks. Took long enough getting here. Yeah, well, I came a long way. The Cartwright sent me to a uh, line shack in Perdido Canyon. Told him I wanted lonely work. They sure came through. How do you do it, Harry? You take a man as smart as Ben Cartwright, you make him give you exactly what you want. Old Harry must hypnotize him. Yeah, well, I couldn't do it alone. Is this the stuff I'll need? You're in business. Yeah, it's very nice. Now, what would a nice, clean, working cowhand from the Ponderosa want with a tool like this? You can count on me being around to answer that question when it's asked. Where do we hit first? The Ponderosa. You can't beat biting the hand that feeds you for a dirty half-breed trick. Yeah, that's always been a winner. I knew you'd like it. You know, Lee, you're a great Indian baiter. Why not? That's my job, ain't it? You just keep doing your job, Lee.
How do you figure, Harry? I don't try. I wonder if he's still with us. <laughs> Why not? No place else for him to go. Let's get out of here. Much obliged, Sheriff. Don't you mention it. Howdy, Ben. Roy. I heard you had some horses stolen last night. Where'd you hear that? Well, maybe I only expected to hear it. I was talking to Chet and Billy here, and they were telling me that they lost some horses last night. Like it's not, I'm gunshot. How uh, you are it? They got six of ours, including the Palomino Stallion of Paz. They took four of Chet's best stock horses, seven of mine, including the mare and foal. It beats me. We ain't had a horse stealing around Virginia City in so long that, well, I'd about figured it was gone out of style. Well, whoever stole these horses had plenty of style. We checked Hazleton Creek, both sides of the bank for miles. Not a sign of them coming out. Yeah, there's no chance of trailing them from my place. I figured they must have took them out over the trail we used to bring in the Remuda. There's no question about it. This heroine's a real smart umbre when it comes to covering up his tracks. Well, boys, you keep in touch and we'll do the best that we can. Horse thieves make mistakes too, you know. Even smart ones. Right. Well, thanks, Sheriff. All right, All right. take care. We'll see you, Judge. I'd like to make a little bet. This horse thief. I say he's that half breed that's working for you. Well, I'll take that bet, mister. Well, now, I ain't got no rich papa. Well, you just make it for how much you want to make it for. Fifty dollars. You're covered. Gordon, you're pretty sure of this bet. Have you seen Harry Starr stealing any horses? No, I'm just putting my money on what I know about breeds. Now, are you going to tell me that you had this engine where you can watch him every minute? He was about as far away from where those horses were stolen as a man could be. In Perdido Canyon, that's where he's working. Anybody with him? That little half-engine must be getting lonely out there all by himself. Sheriff, if you want to catch yourself a horse thief, I got a hunch this Perdido Canyon is a good place to start. Seems like kind of a long way to me to check on a man's hunch. Should have realized you wouldn't want to embarrass the Cartwrights. Maybe after he gets away with a few more horses, you'll see it different. I agree with you, Roy. There's no evidence that Harry Starr stole any horses. And it's a long way to go to checking a hunch. But if Mr. Burton here is going to be shooting his mouth off around town, maybe little Joe and I could save a little time by checking on it on the way home. If you do that, Ben, I'll be obliged to you. And let me know after you talk to this Harry Starr. I'm going with you. I'll meet you here with my horse. I sure want to see your faces when you find out that this half Comanche has paid you back for trusting him. That Burton talks, I can't figure out if he thinks every horse thief's a half-breed or every half-breed's a horse thief. A man like Burton uses it either way. Whichever way suits his purpose, unless it's gone. You take it easy, Roy. I'll do that. He ain't here. So funny about it. We didn't send him up here to lie around the shack all day. We sent him up here to work. That's probably what he's doing. He's probably up in the canyon working that watering basin. That's one of the jobs he was supposed to do. We'll run out and look for him there. I think I'll stick here. Poke around the shack a little bit. I'll stay up here too, Pop. Yeah, well, I'll go up the canyon.
How long you say he's been living in this shack? Brought him up here four days ago. Looks pretty neat, don't it? Almost like he hadn't been here at all. You remember pretty well what he brought with him? Mm-hmm. Well, would you say there's uh, four days grub missing? A lot of game in this canyon, Burton. Is that right? Now, what do you expect to find? I don't know. Maybe I'm looking around just for the fun of it. Look here. Looks like Brandon irons, don't they? Never saw one like this before. Maybe I'm not as smart as you are, Cartwright, but uh, couldn't this iron be used to change the Ponderosa brand? When I find a brand that's been changed, I'll remember your idea. Let's try something, Card, right? See if there's anything to that crazy idea of mine. That's the Ponderosa brand, right? Sure no trick to change a brand, is it? No sign of Harry, huh? No. Just found that corral hidden up in the drawer. But half a dozen horses there. Some of them are, some of the neighbors. Do you mind paying me that bet now, Cartwright? Not until we find Harry. Tell you what I'll do. I'll let the bet ride. One hundred dollars says that Comanche friend of yours is off right now fixing to steal some more horses. I'm going into town and tell the sheriff. He'll want to get up a little search party. And that's one party I don't want to miss. I just can't be. When I rode out here with Harry the other day, we... A little time to talk. He told me about how it was when he was a kid. He had no friends. Nobody wanted him. He said we were the only friends he had. I want to believe in him, Pop. I'd like to, too. Let's get the rest of the horses. must be fed by snow back in the mountains. Whoa. Never mind that stream. Did they raise the reward money yet? They doubled it. Well, it's about time. I was beginning to wonder if I was appreciated. Appreciated? It's all you hear anybody talk. Harry Starr, Harry Starr. Where'd he hit last night? Makes our job simple. Lee's right. Nobody questions anything except where is that breed getting off to with all them horses. They're spooked, real spooked. 
Well, it took ten days to get him spooked enough to raise a reward. But you know, this is rich country. They'll double it again in a couple more days. We're pressing our luck now, Harry. I say we cash out. We move to Wyoming or the Dakotas. Let them folks take a look at Harry the half-breed horse thief. No, no. I want to see that reward money doubled again. You're talking like you're hungry, Harry. Listen, these ranchers got up a kitty. They'll pay $20 a head for every stolen horse that's found. Add that to the reward money, we can be in the clear with $5,500. Why take any chances? Lee, you sound like a man whose skin might be a little yellow. Well, even so, Harry, I never thought I'd hear you judge a man by the color of his skin. We pull out when I say, not before. I see it different, Harry. Stokey? I do, too. Clawson? Me, too. Warren? So you had it all worked out before you even got here, huh? No matter what we worked it out, Harry, we worked it out. You gotta live with it. Joe, I've been watching for a chance to talk to you. It's funny, I've been wanting to talk to you too, Harry. Do I talk to my friend or do I talk to his gun? Oh, I'm not a horse thief, Joe. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm not. You tell me how the horses got in Perdido Canyon. You answer that and I'll meet you halfway. I can't, Joe. All I know is what happened to me. All right, what happened to you? Well... It was about the third night in the line shack, and I thought I heard somebody outside. I remember opening the door and taking about two steps, and that's all. The next thing I knew, it was daylight, and I was coming to in a pine thicket about ten miles from the shack. Why didn't you go back to the shack? I did. We were there. You weren't. I saw Lee Burton first, so I crawled back into the brush, and I heard you all name me a horse thief. No, not all of us. But if you weren't, why don't you come out then and tell us? If your father was a renegade Comanche, you wouldn't ask that question. A lot of horses are stolen, Harry. People in a real angry mood, you didn't help yourself by running away. All these people have to do is think a half-breed guilty, and he's liable to hang. Oh, you'll get a fair trial here. A trial? You asking me to turn myself into the sheriff? You have to. Oh, no. No. At least I had this chance to talk to you, Joe. I'm sorry, I can't let you go, Harry. Well, then you're gonna have to shoot me down, because I'm not buying the lynching party, even from you. Look, all I'm trying to tell you is you'll get more justice in Virginia City than you will by, by running into some bounty hunter out on the road. I'd never get as far as that sheriff if I rode into town. We'll be with you. You'll get there. Well, now, if you and your father rode in with me, then maybe I would have a chance. Pause in the house, I'll tell him. Well, just a minute now. If I go your way, I'll meet you at the Furnace Creek Crossing tomorrow at noon, straight up. We'll be there. Don't let me down, Harry. I'm believing in you. I won't, Joe. <laughs>
I made a mistake. Well, give him a little more time. It's an important decision for him to make. I never should have left that decision up to him. Well, you did what you could. It's up to Harry now. It's far enough, Cartwright. Stop right there. Right out. Now. Cartwrights are in there. Well, I don't have to tell you that I uh, earned this reward. You earned yourself a rope around your neck. For hanging a horse thief? Poster says dead or alive, don't it? Well, I've been trying to tell you. All he ever wanted to do was kill a half-breed. Now, I say the object was murder, and that's what it was. Now, Ben, I don't believe you got any real proof of that. And besides, hanging a horse thief simply ain't murder in this territory. Look, Roy, there were four of them. They could have brought them in for trial if they wanted to. Card right, that half Comanche got away with over 75 horses, some of them yours. Hold on there. Nobody saw him steal one horse, and nobody saw him in possession of any horses. What about the animals we found out at your lion shack? What about them branding irons? This poster said this $4,000 come to me, and that's all I care about. Mister, I've got to see the remains before I authorize the payment of any reward money. Sheriff, you mean to tell me you don't take the Cartwright's word for what they saw? You think they'd come in here just to make me an easy $4,000? Mister, it don't make no difference what I think. I have got to see the body. Now, I believe it's a little late to be heading out that way this evening. We'd no more than get to the crossroads and it'd be dark. But we'll go out the first thing in the morning and examine that grave. Well, I'm ready whenever you are, Sheriff. Me and the boys will be glad to take you there. Ben, don't look at me like that. I'm doing my job the best way I know how. Suppose some regular rancher had a caught star and strung him up. Would you be telling me to lock him up for murder? If he'd gone out of his way to kill him, yes. Ben, I agree with you that every man is entitled to his day in court and all that, but let's look at this thing practically. An expensive court trial wouldn't make no difference to Star. He'd have been hung anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right, Roy. Just forget about him. He's only a half-breed. Joe, forget it, Joseph. I'm sorry, Ben, but it's in the books. Hanging a horse thief just ain't murder in this territory. Sure it ain't. Didn't expect to see you Cartwrights out here this morning. Don't you ever give up? We came out to claim Harry Starr's body. I guess we're a little late. Wolves got to him already. That's all we could find, Roy. Burton, don't you even have enough respect for a dead man to give him a proper grave? Did you ever see a white man after Comanches got done with him? Don't talk to me about respect for dead Indians. Sheriff, you still have to see the body before you pay the money? You get your money, all right. But I'm gonna see to it personally that you spend it any other place in Virginia City. Well, 
might as well go home. Well, you and Hoss go ahead. I'll be along after a while. What do you have in mind? I know that I just want to take some time and think this thing through. Would you uh, like to talk it through? I just can't help thinking I put that rope around Harry's neck myself. Look, Joe. If Harry had done like you told him, if he'd have gone in and turned himself into the sheriff, he'd still be alive, wouldn't he? That's right. Joe, we're men. We're not mystics or foretellers of the future. We can't be responsible for the consequences of any of our actions. We don't know what they're going to be, even in the best of faith. I think that's the word, Bob. What? Faith. I really had faith in believing what Harry told me, then it's about time I did something about it. Like what? If there were 70 horses stolen. If I'm going to be honest in believing that Harry didn't take them, then I want to find out who did and where they are. Son, don't use this as an excuse to go after Burton for what he did to Harry. I won't. I promise you I won't. Be careful. What are you looking at? Go on, get out of here. <laughs> You'll be back to see me. Sure, I ain't just keep your light burning. I can't afford to keep it burning too long. Well, let me see here. Never mind. That ought to be enough to keep it burning till I get back. that for? Shut up. Stokey, get back down the trail, see if anybody's following us. We'll wait for you up ahead. Sure. Sure, I'm sure. What are you getting so spooky about?
Joe, easy. Harry. Yeah, I'm not a ghost, Joe. I'm as real as this gun. Yeah, but I saw, I saw you hanging from a tree. Sure, I still have the rope burns under my arms, trying to keep the weight out of the noose. So that's why the grave was empty, huh? Yeah, that's why, Joe. Now, get your hands behind your head. Move on down there. I said move. Come on, Burton, keep digging. I want Harry Starr's grave real deep this time. Go on, throw it over with the others. Throw it over with the others. so wrong about him. I wanted to be his friend. I'm afraid that isn't what Harry had in mind. I hope I'm never that stupid again. Oh, you weren't stupid. I wasn't. No. You have to admit, Pie sure made it easy for him. I'll try asking yourself why you did. Why, well, I thought I was the only friend he had in the world. That he was alone, taking a beating. He couldn't help himself. In other words, he was an underdog. You had no way of knowing that he was anything else. Joe. Never feel guilty about having warm human feelings toward anyone. If it'll be of any comfort to you. I felt exactly the same way about Harry as you did. For the same reasons. That doesn't make the reasons wrong. Just Harry. <laughs> 